and welcome everyone. My name is Michael Williams. I'm an administrative law judge in the legal department of the Ohio Power Siting Board, which I will reference as the board throughout today's proceeding. I've been assigned by the board to conduct a workshop in case number 21-902-GE-BRO, which involves the review of the Ohio Administrative Code rules in chapters 4906-1 through 4906-7 which in general involve the board's authority to regulate the certification and operation of major utility facilities within the state as described in revised code chapter 4906. Due to the continuing COVID-19 emergency and in order to safely accommodate the public, today's workshop is being held through WebEx, which enables interested persons to witness the workshop and offer comments on the proposed rule adoption by telephone or video on the internet. I also note that the event is being aired via YouTube and will be available for future viewing through the board's website. Before we get started on, with the workshop, I would like to address some preliminary issues. First, if you experience technical difficulties during the workshop, we have several options. If your internet connection drops at any point, you can try to join the WebEx by video again, or you can participate by phone. If those options are unsuccessful, please call the board's legal department at 614 466-6843 for immediate assistance. Finally, if you merely wish to listen to the workshop using your phone instead of accessing via WebEx on the internet, you can listen to the workshop by dialing 1-408-418-9388 and entering meeting number 179-313-1366 when prompted. More information about the WebEx technical help options can be obtained through the chat feature which will be available throughout the workshop. You may click on the chat button at any time to obtain technical assistance or to ask procedural questions during the workshop. The chat feature should not be used for any other purpose, such as to offer comments about the proposed rules that are subject to today's workshop. Please be aware that chats are recorded and should not be considered private. Further chats are not also a part of the official record in this case. During today's workshop, individuals who have registered to provide comments should speak when I read their names from the registration list. Individuals who are commenting by video will be unmuted by a board staff member, Micah Schmidt, when it is time for their comments. If you're providing comments by telephone, a board staff member will call you at your phone number when it is your time to comment. Please bear with us. We work to queue up those that are commenting individually by phone or otherwise. We ask that you keep your comments to a reasonable length of time and avoid repetitive comments. To avoid unnecessary background noise, we will keep your microphone on mute unless you are commenting. Again, if you have questions about this process as the workshop proceeds, please use the chat function. Micah Schmidt is our, web ho our event host who will be overseeing the event on WebEx. We have additional staff who are helping to facilitate the workshop and monitoring the chat function. Now with those preliminary technical issues out of the way, we'll officially uh, start the, uh, the, the record. I know we've been on record, but we'll open the record for today's uh, proceeding. The Ohio Power Siting Board has scheduled for hearing at this time and place, case number 21-902-GE-BRO, which is captioned in the matter of the Ohio Power Siting Board's review of Ohio Administrative Code chapters 4906-1, 4906-2, 4906-3, Forty nine oh six dash four, forty nine oh six dash five, forty nine oh six dash six, and forty nine oh six dash seven. My name is Michael Williams, and I am the administrative law judge assigned by the board to preside over today's workshop. Today's workshop is a further step in the rulemaking process regarding whether modifications should occur to the rules at issue. As we begin today's workshop, a bit of history is helpful. The board began the informal evaluation of the rules at issue uh, beginning in March of 2020. The board conducted three stakeholder engagement meetings on March the 11th of 2020, March the 12th of 2020, and May the 12th of 2020 to gather information as to what changes to the rules may be beneficial to the public, as well as major utility facilities that operate or seek to operate in the state. In connection with those meetings, the board pledged that it would conduct multiple workshops as it begins the formal rule evaluation process, and today's workshop is in follow-up to that pledge. Did have an additional in-person workshop this morning and there's an, another virtual workshop session set for a Friday morning. As described in the September 3rd, 2021 entry that scheduled today's workshop, the board is interested in comments as to all of the rules described in the case. But there is an emphasis on issues that involve the process for considering certificate applications for electric generation facilities 
electric transmission facilities, and gas pipelines, including the potential for implementing a new rule that would be specific to electric generation facilities associated with solar panels. I also note that the scheduling entry at pages three and four identified 13 topics to assist stakeholders in preparing comments. That list is certainly not intended to be exhaustive and the board welcomes all comments as to the issues being considered. Now, following today's workshop, board staff will review the comments received and determine recommended changes to the rules. After staff's review, the board will open this case for formal written comments to be filed later in this docket. Once the written comment period is concluded, the board will consider the adoption of rule changes or additions within the Ohio Administrative Code. I want to stress that today's workshop is your initial opportunity to provide feedback on the consideration of the proposed rules. Also, nothing said today will be considered binding on any of the interested stakeholders. Binding recommendations will be part of the formal written comment proceeding that will follow today's workshop. I would also emphasize that today's workshop is not intended to discuss any case or pending proceeding currently before the board. This workshop is being transcribed by a court reporter from Armstrong and Oki. If you plan to testify, please speak clearly so that the court reporter can accurately reflect your comments on the record. Also, if you have a prepared written statement, it would be helpful to provide a copy of that to the court reporter as well, which you can do by emailing it to the Ohio Power Siding Board at contact OPSB at PUCO.Ohio.gov. Now, normally in the context of an in-person workshop, as we did this morning, I would simply open up the floor for comments, ask that you come forward and give your name and address and begin speaking. But for this virtual session, uh, we will call uh, people who are presenting in the order that they pre-registered in accordance with the instructions from the September 3rd, 2021 entry. Uh, though I do note, uh, we have some changes uh, to the pre-registration list that was published in the docket in this case. And I'll just go ahead and I guess briefly highlight those at the outset. Um, I have uh, our fourth witness, uh, Sarah Conley Ballow is not presenting today. Fifth witness, Miranda Lepla is not presenting today. Our sixth and seventh witnesses, uh, Jason Rayfeld and Jamie Mears have asked to be uh, reversed in order. So uh, Mr. Rayfeld will go six and uh, Jamie Mears will go seventh. Um, Hector Garcia Santana testified uh, live at this morning's uh, workshop. Uh, and so he will not be presenting and uh, Jonathan Wygonski uh, may or may not be presenting uh, last on today's agenda. So uh, those are the changes. We'll certainly go through those individually as we proceed. Uh, so with that, we will uh, call our first uh, testifying witness, uh, Deandra Navratil. You've been promoted if you can enable your audio and video. Thank you. We do not have any comment today. Thank you, Ms. Navratil. Our second commenter is Amy Kurt. You've been promoted if you can enable your audio and video. Ms. Kurt. I show you as being on mute still. Hmm. Oh, oh, there how you about go. now? Can you hear me? Yeah. Loud, All right. Loud and clear. Uh, thank you very much. Let me uh, see if I can get my video here too. There we go. There you are. I got you. Please identify yourself and uh, where you're from, and uh, begin your comments, please. Sure. Um, my name is Amy Kurt, and I'm the senior manager of regional government affairs for EDP Renewable North America. We are the largest owner and operators of wind farms in Ohio and the fourth largest owner and operator of wind farms in the country. Um, we have four wind farms in Ohio. They're in Paulding and Hardin County. Um, and we have a operation and maintenance office that hosts most of our staff in Ohio and in Payne, Ohio. Um, we are really proud to have um, brought incredible economic development opportunities to Northwestern Ohio. Our projects have contributed more than $8 million in tax payments through the pilot program that have helped local schools, roads, fire districts, police departments, townships, and counties in many ways. Um, we've contributed more than $20 million to individual landowners who are leasing their lands to us to host our infrastructure on their properties. We've created more than 500 construction jobs and more than 50 permanent jobs to 
manage, ma maintain, and operate our facilities. Um, I have a few kind of general broad-based comments for the board to consider today, and then I'd like to just echo our support for the associations with whom we're members, so the MEREC, the Mid-Atlantic Renewable Energy Coalition, as well as ACP, the American Clean Power Association, um, will both be submitting joint written comments, and we support um, the very more detailed uh, responses that they've provided in those written comments as well. Uh, but generally, I, I'd like to just say that we really appreciate the board throwing out or pu putting out these um, overarching questions for um, industry and others to consider. And we very strongly encourage the board to provide an equal or even deeper level of opportunity to review and um, consider more detailed um, proposals that are put forth. I think that that our industry um, and renewable energy projects take many years to develop, many years to construct, and are in operation for decades. And major changes, whether in law or in rule, can have dire impacts on our ability to uh, do business in the state of Ohio. So we would encourage the OPSB to um, put forward their proposals and allow for time for our industry to react and to consider what you've put forth. And we look forward to working with the OPSB staff as they move forward um, with all of the um, ideas that are being considered today. Um, as you know, we've, we've dealt with a lot of changes in Ohio that have made doing business in the state uh, challenging, in particular on the wind side when the legislature enacted uh, extremely stringent setback requirements, it essentially put a stop to most of our industry's business. Uh, EDP Renewables was lucky to have squeaked out one more project under the new setback regime in a community that is very supportive and very familiar with wind because they had experienced other wind farms in the past. And we think that those factors contributed to broader community acceptance of our projects because the broader community was able to see the broader benefits that were brought to the schools, to the county, um, and, and all of the various taxing entities that were able to benefit from our wind farm. Um, so we would encourage the OPSB staff uh, to consider those types of changes, whether they're setbacks or lighting or vegetation management, I think it's, it's question number, letter T, um, to the solar industry and the drastic impact that those types of requirements could have on the ability for the solar energy industry to move forward and for us to move forward uh, building solar projects in the state of Ohio. Um, I, I'll highlight just a couple of other um, of the lettered questions. I believe it's letter L that talks about transmission. Transmission is essential to the growth of our business of, of the renewable energy industry in Ohio on many levels. Um, but a piece of that transmission story is the generator lead lines that allow us to interconnect our projects to the existing grid. And we think that those transmission lines are different than kind of more broad-based transmission infrastructure and development in the state. Oftentimes, the lines that we build to connect our projects to the grid are much shorter um, and can be in a variety of voltages. But we very rarely, if ever, would rely on uh, eminent domain to build those lines. So the public interest criteria for the generator lead lines, we feel, should be distinct than just any other transmission line that's being built that may be looking to rely on eminent domain. All of our projects have had complete landowner support and buy-in as we lease land for those generator lead lines, those transmission lines, and therefore the public interest criteria may not need to be as stringent for other transmission build-out. Um, the other question that I'll highlight is letter Q, um, and there are a couple of other ones. I think it's um, P that may involve some of the other studies that have to do 
with project development. So I think Hugh talks about the environmental studies or the aviation regulations. Those are essential studies that we should undertake and essential coordination that must be undertaken between our companies and other state agencies or other federal agencies, for example, the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA. And we appreciate the current regime at the Ohio Power Siting Board that allows developers to start that coordination at the beginning of the Power Siting Board application review process and allows us to complete the, those reviews and to receive those permits throughout the power siting board process. Um, I believe it's um, the current regulation for wind farms where we have to turn in our FAA permits prior to construction, but we don't necessarily need those in hand when we're, in hand when we're submitting our application. That timing flexibility is essential because agency coordination can take many months as it should as you're working through the details of your project. Um, the FAA permits can take many months, uh, oftentimes up to a year to receive from the federal government. And we need the, the flexibility to be able to turn in those permits prior to construction and not have every single um, permit and every single agency coordination completely tied up prior to or when we go to submit an application with the Power Siting Board. Um, and then I will highlight um, letter uh, T. Again, this um, proposes some very detailed questions to the solar industry about, um, and, and R as well. So drainage, irrigation, stormwater runoff. Um, so sorry, let me hit on R first. Um, these are all important things to building a successful solar project and we would be happy to provide further information to the Power Siting Board about our plans, for example, to um, mitigate our impacts to field drainage. But again, I would encourage the Power Siting Board to allow for flexibility to turn those plans in prior to construction. A stormwater runoff management plan, we absolutely do those. That's a part of our uh, NIPTI permits. But those things come a lot further along in the development stage of your project when you have your final engineering and you have all of your final um, detailed scopes provided. And we would appreciate the flexibility from the Ohio Power Siting Board to provide those plans and permits later on in the um, application process. Additionally, with field drained tile, um, we know that solar projects will um, run into drain tile and we think it's extremely important that the power siting board provide flexibility to developers to not just repair the existing drain tile that is in the the solar field today but to actually come up with a new strategy for field drain tile and to provide that plan to the power siting board to the landowners and to the local community to show what we will do to mitigate impacts to drain tile um, and allow us to actually relocate drain tile around our facilities um, and ensure that the overall impact to drain tile um, and to drainage in the community is, um, is reduced or is, is the same as it was prior to our project coming in. Um, okay, and then lastly, I will wrap up my comments with T. T is a loaded question. Uh, there is a lot in there and I would encourage the Power Siting Board staff to tread lightly um, any major changes to setbacks, to landscape, to lighting, to perimeter fencing, to noise, to vegetation management, these, these um, types of regulations can be project killers. You may not think that a very slight change to a setback would be a big deal, but with all of the different puzzle pieces that come together when you're developing a project, one small change to the regulations can have a very, very substantial impact to our ability to build a project economically. Um, and um, I would encourage the staff to work closely with, with industry and with communities on coming up with regulations that can allow us to um, move projects forward in the state of Ohio, unlike what the legislature did with setbacks for the wind energy industry. So with that, I would again, express my appreciation for accepting comments, particularly on the web um, and virtually. 
um, as it's difficult for many of us to travel. And we really appreciate you opening this opportunity up to take comments in so many different ways at so many different times. So I'll end my comments there. Thank you so much. Ms. Kurt, if you would hang on for just a second. Okay, sure. I still have you. Um, I have one question uh, or point of clarification, then one comment on my own. So uh, in terms of the uh, separating uh, generator lead lines from transmission lines generally, uh, would you propose a definition for generator lead lines? Would that be based on length of the line or how, how would you define that? It's hard to, thank you for your question, Mr. Williams. Um, it's hard to uh, differentiate on length because we've had some projects where the gen lead line is 500 feet and we've had other projects where the generator lead line is two miles. Um, but I think for us, the differentiating factor is we get full landowner, um, we acquire all of our land from, from landowners um, through negotiated leases that are, um, um, that, that require full landowner buy-in. So the definition then what you would propose would be based on control of the, of the land rights. I think so, and I'll caveat that one one uh, piece further is, I believe, and I'll have to double check, but we uh, we may have come before the power siting board in the past with a project where we might not have had all of the land leased when we applied for our certificates, but we had all of the land leased by the time we were provided a certificate. Um, so I don't think that you should require all of the land to be leased at the initiation, but I do think that the difference is that we are not asking you for eminent domain authority. Okay, and that segues nicely into my, my comment, which is uh, to the extent there are industry specific mechanics uh, that as a, for example, obtaining the FAA um, permission involves this level of lead time and this level of detailed information regarding specific siting. Um, again, as a, for example, um, the more information you can share with the board regarding those specifics and those mechanics at the, uh, at the comment period, the, the more helpful it will be. So if, if there are issues that you're aware of that FAA permission now takes, you know, 14 months and has to be very site specific when it used to take uh, four months to get a general, you know, those, those sorts of issues uh, would certainly be helpful to the board in the comment phase. Sure. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, it's tricky because it's ever changing, right? So one project, you might get an FAA permit in nine months and other projects might take 14 months. You just, you don't necessarily know at the outset. So that's again, one of the reasons why we appreciate the flexibility and not having to provide every single permit from every single external party or external agency at the beginning of the process, but to be able to provide those before construction. Okay, thank you for your comments. Thank you. Welcome. Our next uh, presenter is Kaylee Bangston. You've been promoted. If you can enable your audio and video. Hello. Can you hear me? This is Kaylee. Bangston. We hear you loud and clear. Fantastic. My video is not camera has been working this week, but I will proceed. So thank you so much. Uh, my name is Kaylee Bankston. I'm a senior manager of government and regulatory affairs for Invenergy Renewables. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to provide a few comments. I am not going to address each of the questions posed in the docket, but instead wanted to provide a few general statements. We will plan on providing more specific comments once the draft rules have been circulated. Um, like I mentioned before, I work for Invenergy. We are a leading uh, renewable energy development company with almost 30,000 megawatts of projects developed globally. We are very proud to have been developing projects and partnering with communities in Ohio for over 10 years, and at this point are exclusively focused on solar development in Ohio. Uh, most recently in the past few years, we have completed the development and are now, are now in operation of a project in Hardin County. We have three other solar projects that are already permitted by OPSB and have, um, you know, thoroughly enjoyed, um, or, or excuse me, we are working on the process of um, permitting a few other late stage projects in, in other counties. We have greatly enjoyed partnering with um, the communities across Ohio and have uh, really enjoyed the opportunity and for those communities allowing us to become, you know, members of the community. 
So given our experience, I, I just really wanted to take a few minutes today to say thank you um, to the stakeholders and to OPSB uh, for the opportunity to participate in this workshop and, and the opportunity to review the rules once the draft rules are out for comment. Um, to date, Invenergy has appreciated their respectful working relationship with OPSB staff and the board um, and in following OPSB staff, you know, existing um, what we believe is an extremely robust permitting process. Um, as a company, we're always happy to field questions from, from staff or board members, from the local communities, landholders, um, and other key stakeholders throughout the process. We believe that successful projects all begin um, with significant upfront discussion with local communities um, for us to provide information and education and also for us to receive feedback from those communities. Um, we believe the current process establishes a really strong foundation for projects to move forward successfully in the development process and into construction and operation. Um, I also just want to add quickly or offer quickly that um, we believe LPSB's you know, environmental review established in the current rules is extremely robust and is as all-encompassing as we have seen in any um, state uh, process. So those are just my kind of quick remarks. I want to just want to say thanks for the opportunity to engage and we look forward to participating in these workshops, further discussion, and um, reviewing the rules once they are circulated. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Banks, and thanks for your appearance today. Our next presenter is Jason Rayfeld. You've been promoted if you can enable your audio and video. Good afternoon, Mr. Rayfeld. Good afternoon, Mr. Williams. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, please proceed. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Williams, OPSB and staff and esteemed participants, thank you for the opportunity to address you on these important issues today. My name is Jason Rayfeld and I serve as the executive director of the Utility Scale Solar Energy Coalition of Ohio. Our organization represents the majority of large scale solar development in Ohio with 26 members primarily made up of developers. I'm here today to offer informal comments on the rules regarding solar energy development. Our organization intends to file written comments on this workshop at a later date. As a state, we're exceptionally fortunate to have the opportunity to consider rules that will impact so many projects, businesses, communities, and individual families across our state. The solar development happening now has already brought an overwhelming array of benefits to a broad spectrum of Ohioans and Ohio businesses, and there's more to come. As a state, we're also fortunate to have a body such as the OPSB that can act as a professionally staffed clearinghouse for large energy projects and other important infrastructure. Our organization has supported the OPSB in many venues and will continue to do so. Consistency in regulation and development, reliability, and a reasonable process are all benefits of having the OPSB. These benefits bring businesses, bring business and drive opportunity and expansion throughout Ohio. As asked by Mr. Williams, USEC will offer general comments today on the questions posed in the order. As mentioned above, a more detailed written comments will be filed at a later time. So to get right started here, uh, question I, uh, should uh, electric and gas uh, facilities rules be combined? Uh, our comment is in a word, no. Uh, the components of each application are vastly different and having the requirements separated provides applicants with a clear set of instructions specific to each type of project. Either way the OPSB chooses to do this, the requirements should be set out in unambiguous terms about which requirements are for which application. Question J, what additional information, if any, should be included in a proposed project summary? USEC believes the current rule is sufficient and does a good job of providing an at-a-glance understanding of the project without overwhelming with too much detail. However, if the board preferred more information in the summary, a boundary map, the URL of the project webpage, if any, and a point of contact for the project could be included. Question K, what additional information, if any, should be included in the project description and project schedules that are currently required by the OAC? Comment. Uh, USEC believes the current rule is sufficient and provides the OPSB with all the information needed to evaluate projects. Designs currently submitted for solar farms show all of the components with a high degree of precision and finality. Preliminary layouts are intended by the applicants to remain substantially similar to the final design required to be submitted prior to construction. However, due to ongoing technological innovations, continued engineering and survey work, public feedback, and communications during the certification process, 
the precise location of these features may be subject to change within the defined project area. Importantly, utility scale solar applications present preliminary site designs that fully depict the maximum extent of the proposed facility. This ensures that staff and other stakeholders have a clear understanding of the maximum potential impact at the time of this preliminary design. Uh, question L, in regard to a proposed electric transmission line or gas pipeline, uh, USEC has no, no comment here. Um, it just does not appear, uh, appear to be for transmission requirements specific to solar. Question M, in regard to project siting, what information should an applicant file to support its consideration of public involvement as to the site or route selection process? This question appears to be geared uh, largely towards transmission route selection. However, site selection for solar farms is largely dictated by its need for uh, flat, previously disturbed land, proximity to transmission lines, clean interconnect to the grid, and the ability to lease land. As you know, Ohio is a competitive state for generation. As such, choices regarding site selection are highly competitive and often confidential until an applicant has enough information to reliably share project details with the public. Additionally, and maybe most importantly, after extensive negotiations on Senate Bill 52, the legislature chose to express their desire for public involvement by adding a new requirement whereby developers must hold a public meeting to share their proposed project, including type, size, nameplate capacity, and a map of geographic boundaries. Developers must notice the county commissioners of each county and the township trustees of each township in which the project is located at least 90 days and not more than 300 days prior to applying for a certificate. This new legislative requirement strikes a balance between informing the public as soon as possible while respecting the iterative nature of the development process at this early stage. Utility scale solar applicants must undergo a lengthy investment, investigation, research, engineering, legal, and evaluation process by PJM before they even know if the potential project is viable. Public involvement prior to determination as to whether or not the project is possible from a technical perspective risks misinforming and misleading the local community. However, public involvement should begin as soon as is reasonable. Initial designs are commonly changed and updated due to local community involvement. As a result, USIC believes the current rule is sufficient. Question N, for all applications, what information should an applicant file in the public docket in regard to public interaction and complaint resolution surrounding significant pre-construction and pre-operation project developments. USIC is supportive of having significant activities related to public interaction and complaint resolution filed within the applicant's public docket. USIC also sees no problem with providing high-level public engagement and complaint resolution data at predetermined intervals, such as during the compliance review and prior to public hearing. I would note that we feel strongly that personal, personal identifiable information should be protected as we have had instances where individuals were, th were threatened from having their, uh, for example, their home address released to the public and um, um, people encouraged to show up at, at that individual's home. USEC welcomes the opportunity to work with board staff to develop rules for reporting activities that are considered significant and what information should be included as part of, of that filing that can assist the board with their determination while still maintaining individual safety and competitive spirit. Question O, consistent with revised code 4906-221 and 4906-222, what information should a wind or solar facility applicant file regarding its decommissioning plans? USIC supports transparency and consistency in developing sound decommissioning plans, which provide assurances to the public the OPSB and USEC members regarding expectations for the final stage of life for solar energy generating facilities. Therefore, USEC proposes that all newly approved solar generation projects include clear and consistent standard stipulation language related to decommissioning requirements. USEC believes that the consistent use of decommissioning language will provide greater transparency to all stakeholders, ensure that the OPSB staff receives consistent detail from all developers, facilitates efficient project planning and will allow for streamlined implementation. We support the language on this subject in Senate Bill 52. Question P, what information should an applicant file in regard to communications with local government contacts within a project area? Senate Bill 52 requires projects not otherwise grandfathered to hold a public meeting in each county where the project is located. Following this meeting, the county commissioners may choose to restrict the project in a number of ways. 
The practical effect of this provision is that applicants prior to proceeding to the OPSB will be required to have extensive and well-documented interaction with local government. Additionally, negotiation of critical issues such as road use agreements and pilot agreements requires significant communication with local officials. All communications with local public officials are public record and are subject to open meetings requirements. For these reasons, USEC does not believe any additions are necessary. Question Q, what information should an applicant file in support of its compliance with environmental and aviation regulations? USEC believes that the current regulations require the submission of more than adequate information about compliance with environmental and aviation requirements. Thus, nothing additional is required. Question R, what information should an applicant file in regard to its planned management of noxious weeds, irrigation systems mitigation, field drainage system mitigation, and stormwater runoff management? Noxious weeds, USEC is open to a requirement that applicants submit a detailed plan for management of noxious weeds. Plans could include grazing, pollinator habitat, mowing, spraying and seeding, and planting to control and minimize noxious weed growth. Irrigation system mitigation, if irrigation is present within the project area, applicants could be required to submit a plan to avoid damage to irrigation practices in the area and to repair any impacted irrigation systems in a timely manner. Field drainage system mitigation. USEC recommends that the applicant submit a plan both to reasonably identify potential field drainage systems and repair or replace any damaged drain systems in a timely manner. The applicant should avoid where possible or minimize to the extent practicable any damage to functioning field tile drainage systems and soils resulting from the construction, operation, or maintenance of the facility. Damaged field tile systems should be promptly repaired or rerouted to at least original conditions or modern equivalent at the applicant's expense. However, if the affected landowner does agrees to not having the damaged field, field tile system repaired, they may do so only if the field tile systems of adjacent landowners remain unaffected by the non-repair of the landowner's field tile system. Stormwater runoff. The nature of solar farms is largely passive and construction generally maintains permeable soil and vegetative cover. As a result, there should be little concern regarding an increase in stormwater runoff. However, if the board desires more information on this, applicants could be required to provide professional studies on the possibility of changes to stormwater runoff that would affect neighboring lands. If the board desired, USEC would support a requirement for general permit authorization for stormwater discharges construction associated with construction activities from the Ohio EPA prior to construction. Question S, what information should an applicant file in regard to its mitigation of communication system impacts? USEC and its members are unaware of any impact photovoltaic solar installations have on communication systems. I believe this is largely geared uh, towards uh, wind development. Question T, the board is considering implementing a rule to address solar facilities. General areas for consideration include setbacks, landscape, design, perimeter fencing, and operational noise. What requirements should exist as to these issues? Setbacks. USEC remains open to discussion on any topic, any topic in this workshop. However, during Senate Bill 52, the General Assembly chose not to include any specific setback language for solar. As such, we believe it may be outside the jurisdiction of the board to add specific setback language in rule. Additionally, setbacks are generally decided through contractual agreements, such as stipulations, lease agreements, and good neighbor agreements on a case-by-case -case basis. That being said, setbacks really are a matter of viewshed that really impact the immediate adjacent landowner and are different for every individual parcel and situation. As such, they should remain flexible to allow for the variety of situations presented in solar development. On landscape, USEC would support a requirement for applicants to submit a landscape plan in consultation with a landscape architect licensed by the Ohio Landscape Architects Board. On fencing, USEC is open to a requirement that all projects use woven wire agricultural fence on wooden poles or some suitable alternative that complies with the National Electric Code rather than barbed wire. On operational noise, solar farms produce very little operational noise and even less that could possibly be heard outside the project area. Developers already provide information regarding noise 
levels through, through a number of engineering studies. As such, USEC believes creating a special rule is unnecessary. And finally, the board is reviewing its uh, question you, the board is reviewing its fee procedures in consideration of implementing a monthly rather than completely upfront payment mechanism. What information should the board consider regarding this issue? USEC supports the current fee procedure of submitting the entire application fee upfront. An upfront fee is simpler, more streamlined, and may create a barrier for entry for projects not sufficiently capitalized to complete responsible development. Monthly fees would also require additional billing and accounting procedures within the OPSB that could add to the already complex analysis of the applications. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on these important rules. This concludes my comments on behalf of the Utility Scale Solar Energy Coalition of Ohio. Mr. Redfield, thank you for your time this, this afternoon. I would, uh, I, I guess, uh, propose the same comment I had to Ms. Kurt earlier, which is to the extent the board considers requiring additional information at the outset of an application. Uh, obviously, the board is, is going to be dependent on industry to provide detailed comments as to what forms of additional information can reasonably be ripened as part of an application and what forms are more appropriately uh, further down the design phase. So I would just implore you to consider those details as you submit comments in this case. Thank you. We will do so. Appreciate the comment very much. Thank you, Mr. Rayfeld. Our next presenter is Jamie Mears. You've been promoted if you can enable your audio and video. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, Ms. Mears. Excellent, thank you very much. I'm gonna get my camera set up here. Okay. Perfect. Good afternoon, Mr. Williams and members of the OPSB. My name is Jamie Mears and I'm a project developer with Orsted Onshore North America. Thank you for the opportunity to offer comments today to the OPSB's five-year rulemaking process. Orsted is a global utility scale renewable energy company with over one and a half gigawatts of operational wind and solar capacity in the US. We are committed to responsible development that generates clean, affordable electricity and helps diversify local economies while supporting local development. Recently, our company made a commitment to all future renewable projects will have a net positive impact on local biodiversity. This means that we plan to proactively plant native and pollinator friendly vegetation that will support the maintenance of healthy ecosystems in our project communities. We are also deeply committed to not only serving as experienced knowledgeable developers, but also trusted partners in the communities in which we work. We have partnered with and supported local community organizations, STEM curricular development, in local school districts and local sports teams in the past and ongoing projects. Early and ongoing engagement with the members of our project communities is a core element of our development philosophy at Orsted. At Orsted, we are generally supportive of the current rule in the areas in which OPSB is seeking input. Orsted is aligned with the comments Jason, Jason previously shared that will be submitted by USEC, of which we are a member. We look forward to working with the OPSB, local officials, community members, and other key stakeholders throughout the process to provide industry input and feedback on the benefits, drawbacks, and potential impacts of OPSB rules and decisions related to energy development in Ohio. We support the rulemaking process that provides clear guidance for energy development, while also maintaining flexibility consider, to consider unique aspects of each project on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you again for the opportunity to offer our comments during today's workshop, and we look forward to serving as an industry partner and engaged participant throughout this process. Thank Ms. you. Ms. Mears, thank you for your time and your comments this afternoon. Have a good afternoon. Appreciate it. Our next commenter is Douglas Hurling. You've been promoted if you could enable your audio and video. Good afternoon, Mr. Hurling. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Uh, please proceed when you're ready. Great. Uh, thank you, for, uh, thank you for, uh, for the opportunity to provide input on these rules today. Again, my name is Doug Hurling, I'm Vice President of uh, Open Road Renewables. In this role, I've been charged with leading the development, permitting of utility scale solar projects in Ohio for the last five years. From this vantage point, I've had a front row seat uh, to the o uh, OPSB's fair and balanced review process of renewable energy projects and have witnessed the, uh, the ample opportunity for public input in this process. 
The process has uh, certainly evolved considerably from our first uh, solar facility application um, in 2017 uh, through five others to today. Um, and we appreciate these, these efforts that we're undergoing now to provide greater clarity regarding staff's uh, expectations for future uh, application reviews. Previous commenters have already covered uh, many important aspects of the process and uh, certainly echo uh, Jason Rayfeld's uh, remarks um, along with my other colleagues. But I would like to provide uh, some additional input specifically regarding three aspects of the process. With regard to communication infrastructure, uh, Open Road believes that with respect to solar facilities, the current regulations do, uh, do require the the submission of more than uh, adequate information about uh, communication system impacts. The board's existing rules require comprehensive uh, information on this subject, and specifically the rules require applicants to evaluate and describe the potential for, for the facility to, uh, to interfere with radio and TV reception, uh, radar systems, microwave communication, on and on. Um, and given the low profile of solar and uh, the production of only routine levels of uh, electromagnetic forces, um, which are uh, ubiquitous in modern society, uh, utility-scale solar facilities have essentially no potential to create any such interference um, in the locations where we are typically proposing these projects. Uh, some of my other colleagues have touched on these next two points, but um, I don't think I'm being uh, too, too uh, uh, duplicative here. But um, did want to comment on file engineering and uh, manufacturer uh, information specifically. When OPSB receives an application from a developer, that application is for a proposed utility scale solar generation facility. The proposed is the key operative here. Uh, the application contains a massive amount of data generated by field studies, uh, desktop analysis, prelim engineering, transmission studies, and more. However, from the time this work begins, typically nine to 12 months prior to application submittal, um, all the way to certification if the project meets uh, requirements and is approved by the setting board, typically another nine to 12 months, that's one and a half to two years that may have elapsed since the project really kind of began working on that application. And uh, the time can be twice that in the case is contested. So major investment in the final engineering and procurement would then begin in earnest once, once the certificate is in hand and not appealable. Finalizing engineering and procurement decisions earlier is often impossible due to product evolution and manufacturer lead time requirements. We understand that the OPSB's desire to gather as much information about the project as possible as early as possible. That said, an, an emphasis on providing specific manufacturers or even models of key facility components at the application stage is unnecessary given the similarities in component design, function, and operation. Um, with generic or uh, illustrative information, staff can still feel confident that uh, project impacts are accurately accounted for and that the guardrails are in place to ensure a minimally impactful project during construction, operation, and eventually decommissioning of the project. Um, in a similar vein, uh, over the last five years, I've witnessed a marked shift uh, from post-certificate to pre-certificate compliance with OPSB rules. Um, archaeological phase 1B field work and reporting previously occurred pre-construction and was informed by final design. Conducting a uh, archaeological phase 1B prior to certification or prior to uh, application filing even puts an unnecessary burden on the project and especially on participating landowners. The uh, field season for archaeology is unpredictable and often quite short. Even when a crop comes off early in October, like for many folks this year, Field work usually must wait until all project acreage is in uh, surveyable condition. This typically requires farmers to disk their fields multiple times um, in order to provide adequate surface, uh, surface uh, visibility for uh, field work. For the many farmers in Ohio that adhere to no-till farming practices, this can set them back years in terms of soil health, carbon content, and erosion control. While we've not systematically gathered data on this, we believe that the archaeological field work is generally identifying very few important or high value resources considering the very large areas, often hundreds or thousands of acres that have been uh, systematically surveyed, which is not surprising given that most of these areas are, have been previously disturbed for hundreds of years. There is a better way, a phase 1A work plan and uh, the Ohio Historic Preservation Office approval 
of said work plan represents a rigorous desktop uh, research program and NGIS modeling efforts to identify high probability areas for archaeological sites. Paired with a programmatic agreement, OPSP has the information and assurances necessary to review a solar project application. Work plan, a work plan uh, dictates how the work will be done, and the uh, programmatic agreement, or PA, spells out how the project will work with OPO if a significant site is found in the uh, phase, phase 1B investigation. Sites can be readily avoided with setbacks and impacts mitigated through an established memorandum of understanding process with OPO. Um, again, I thank you for the opportunity to provide comment today. Uh, I look forward to taking part in the ongoing rulemaking process once the rules are available for review. Um, thank you again and have a good day. Thank you, Mr. Hurley. I appreciate your time. Our next presenter is Chanel Montana. You've been promoted if you can enable your audio and video. Ms. Hello, Hurley. good afternoon. Be here and see you loud and clear. Great. Uh, my name is Chanel Montana and I am the Director of Development for LightSource VP. Thank you, Mr. Williams and OPSB for opening this opportunity for comment on the rulemaking. Um, a lot of my colleagues have said many of what I originally was going to speak about, so I'll, I'll keep this fairly brief. Uh, but one, one thing that keeps um, resonating when reviewing this rulemaking and the, and the questions asked is the fact that Ohio isn't in a bubble. Ohio is a marketplace for renewable energy and, and other energy generation that is indeed regional. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to discuss today is the fact that the timeline is quite long. And when we are looking at a potential investment location, we're looking at a number of factors and we're comparing them not only to other sites in Ohio, but to sites in Indiana, to sites in Pennsylvania, where our customers are oftentimes very similar. This long development time often has a very tight budget as well. And those budgets are getting tighter and tighter as the renewable energy industry uh, and particularly the solar industry is growing and becoming much more competitive with new entrants into the marketplace and the demand that is continuing to increase. As you're going through the rulemaking process, I think it's important to really look at the clarity and certainty that's being provided to the development community so that we can indeed construct these projects in the most efficient and effective way possible. And also, you know, relieving regulatory headaches, not only in timing, not only for your staff, but also for us. And we can make sure that we're maintaining um, the studies and information that is being requested. You know, as my colleague before mentioned, these timelines can be quite long. And so the information we're presenting um, when we are actually submitting the application, you know, could be a year prior to when we're reviewing it in a hearing process. And a lot can change in engineering or um, other pieces of the project. And so really having those expectations up front gives us that opportunity to craft the best project that we can. Changing regulatory standards um, and moving goalposts halfway provide that uncertainty to developers and to projects that really um, not only can increase costs for projects, which then eventually will go down to rate pairs, but it also uh, just creates longer headaches and timelines, again, both for developers and OPSB staff. And the streamlining of all of these regulations in the process um, and making sure things are clear and concise up front, I think will help to alleviate that headache for both parties. Um, as we look forward, Again, I, I'm not going to get into the details. Uh, many of my colleagues have, have done that quite well, and I know a number of written comments are coming in, but I think taking that broad regional lens is very important. This is a very competitive marketplace, and regulation is not bad. Nobody is going to say that, but it needs to be done in a fair and balanced way, recognizing that these projects are competing in a region. They're competing not only nationally, but regionally. And if Ohio is going to maintain a very highly regulated state, which, as it has been pointed out today, Ohio is exceptionally regulated with energy generation, um, you know, I think there needs to be an understanding of the impact that will make on the marketplace and then the further economic development it will have in Ohio and what these projects have the potential to do for economic development. We need to strike a fair and balanced approach 
to the rulemaking so that all parties can make the best decisions for their projects and we can continue to see the type of economic development that we've seen thus far with renewable energy. Thank you so much, Mr. Williams, and to all of your staff. Thank you for your time, Ms. Mantina. We'll take your comments under advisement. Our next presenter is Elizabeth Harsh. You've been promoted if you can enable your audio and video. Ms. Harsh. There we are. All right, I hear you. And it may not uh, cooperate with me to get my camera going. I apologize. Is that a problem? It is not a problem for a workshop of this nature. So please uh, proceed uh, just via audio if you're comfortable. I apologize for that. I thought I had everything set. Um, but good afternoon. Good afternoon. I would like to thank the Ohio Power Siting Board staff and Administrative Law Judge, Mr. Williams, for this opportunity to participate in the OPSB role workshop. My name is Elizabeth Harsh, and I am the Executive Director of the Ohio Cattlemen's Association and also part of a family farm in Delaware County. My comments are not specific to questions, but rather more general statements. The Ohio Cattlemen's Association is a membership organization that represents the business interest important to farm families throughout Ohio that raise cattle. It serves as the voice of the state's beef cattle business. OCA's mission is to maintain profitability and growth of Ohio's beef industry while providing consumers with safe and wholesome beef. Ohio's cattle farmers raise approximately 307,000 beef cows with a total value of cattle and calves at 1.45 billion. Perhaps even more important, agriculture is the state's number one industry, contributing nearly $124 billion annually to Ohio's economy, with over 40% of the sales from livestock and poultry farms. Some of the economic contributions of our individual industries in Ohio are as follows. We have member farmers participating in utility-scale solar projects, and many who have been working and planning on these projects for years. A farmer's property and farming assets are a critical part of their financial stability, retirement, and estate planning. Our farmers are feeding the world, and now many are supplying the energy for our communities, families, and businesses. The Ohio Cattlemen's Association, along with the Ohio Farm Bureau, and Ohio's beef, dairy, pork, and poultry farmers strongly opposed Senate Bill 52 and strongly supported the personal property rights of our farmers. Many farmers often lease portions of the land to solar and wind developers, using the lease payments to supplement income, which helps farmers withstand the year-to-year -year turbulence in the agricultural commodity markets. The stable incomes enable farmers to better plan for equipment purchases, expansion of operations, and keep their land in agricultural use as opposed to leasing land to a commercial or residential developer. Utility scale solar development is feeding into the economic viability of our farm families and rural communities. The tax and pilot payments to the counties, townships, and schools is significant. We trust the rigorous OPSB process and know that the current process allows for public involvement and input. Ability to make changes to the project footprint based on feedback and involves dozens of studies, reports, and technical analysis. I ask that you not add any additional regulations that were not addressed in Senate Bill 52. Despite our opposition, the legislature spent a good deal of time and deliberation to settle on the components of Senate Bill 52. The legislature also very clearly grandfathered in all current active projects. I thank you for this opportunity to participate today, and we look forward to remaining engaged to ensure that farmer and landowner rights are protected. Thank you. Ms. Harsh, thank you for your appearance and comments here today. 
our last potential commenter is Jonathan Wygonski. Mr. Wygonski, I know you'd indicated you were tentative, so um, if you would come on with us and let us know if you intend to make comments. You've been promoted if you can enable your audio and video. Hi. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I do not have any comments uh, to add at this time, but uh, thank you for reserving that spot for me. Okay, Mr. Wygonski, thank you for coming on and clarifying that. So with that, I don't have anybody else who pre-registered to testify here today. Uh, in closing, I do want to emphasize that the board appreciates all those who took the time to present um, or to watch today. Uh, the board's consideration of these rules is a large undertaking and impacts many stakeholders uh, within the industry and within the general public. The board values the input that it receives in this pursuit. As for next steps, I want to remind everyone, uh, first of all, we do have uh, our third and final uh, virtual workshop this Friday morning at 930. And registration details uh, are available uh, on the PS OPSB website. Um, after that, I want to uh, remind everyone that the next uh, step in this case will be to open the case for further formal comments pursuant to an upcoming entry. I'd ask everyone to please continue to follow the docket, case number 21-902-GE-BRO. Uh, in this case, uh, as to uh, the opening of that comment a period, uh, the board encourages all to uh, participate further uh, in the consideration process through the formal comment phase of the case. With that, I will conclude today's workshop, and we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone.